This isn't live, is it? No. Okay. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dick Merritt, United States Marine Corps, retired. We're doing an interview this morning at Grassroots Television in Aspen, Colorado. And we're interviewing a married couple have been married for 63 years. Right. Irene uh, and John Tripp. And uh, John was born on 14 May 19. No, 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 no. Let's back that off. <laughs> Irene was born on 14 May 1925, and John was born on 28 July 1919. And uh, I'm with the uh, Roaring Fork Veterans History Project in association with the Library of Congress, and we're co-sponsored with Grassroots Television in Aspen, Aspen Historical Society, and uh, we will be uh, recording these for the Library of Congress and for viewing here in Aspen. I was just walking the street the other day and uh, came into the mall and came across the bon bronze sculpture, 10th Mountain Division Memorial, and it's dedicated in perpetual memory of the 999 young men of the 10th Mountain Division who gave their lives for a cause in the Aleutian Islands in Italy in 1943 to 1945. It is also dedicated and in recognition to those 10th Mountain Division veterans who came to Aspen in the early years after the war to open businesses, teach skiing, work their trades, and assist greatly in making Aspen an internationally recognized ski resort. Their names will always be part of Aspen. And John, we visited, and uh, you were up there in Kiska, Alaska, and in Italy, and we'll develop that whole story. What a what a story that the 10th Mountain had. And Irene, you were here in the States supporting John and all, all the time that he was over there uh, deployed in Europe. John, uh, can you tell us uh, your rank and uh, who you were uh, attached with uh, during World War II? Mm -hmm. I was with the L Company, the 87th Regiment, 10th Mountain Division. And uh, my rank was Tech Sergeant. And I had a mortar section, 60 millimeter mortar section. Okay. And where did, where did you serve? I think we touched a little bit. Well, I served, of course, in the United States, Camp Hale, and uh, also in Mount Kiska and in Italy. In Italy. Okay. And Irene, um, when uh, you met John, you were uh, a Colorado lady? Colorado girl? Yes, yes. I was born in Denver, went to Colorado University, and that's at the time I met him. Where did you meet John? Uh, <laughs> May I tell that story? Well, I'd love to hear it, John. <laughs> we met on a, a golf course in Denver, uh, Wilshire Golf Course, and uh, I haven't played since. <laughs> <laughs> He isn't a great anyway, got fan of golf. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, we met at a party of 10th men because my best friend who I came down from Boulder to Denver with, and because she could stay at my parents' home too, um, and w she was from Sun Valley and a very, very well-known skier and had raced with a lot of the boys from the East who were in the tenth, and I was invited. This we were invited to this party, and that's where I met John. So and you were <laughs> Liberty at that time, then. Uh, uh, yeah. Weekend yeah, Liberty. Yeah, weekend pass. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm What year would that be? 1943. 43. 42. 43. 43. You're right. 43. Yeah. Spring yeah. of 43. Spring of 43. Um, well, let me ask uh, a little bit about. Uh, John, where, where were you raised, uh, brought up? I was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, <laughs> and uh, left there in February 1942 for the Air Corps as a cadet, where I stayed for about six months, and I had 
a problem with uh, my eyes. I couldn't fly a plane. They'd let me be a navigator, and I kind of lost my enthusiasm for the Air Corps, and uh, I was discharged, went home for a month, and re-enlisted in the 87th. Was the draft uh, looking at you, or you, probably, made, the, probably, you, you made the yeah. decision, though? Yeah, I, I had two honorable discharges. <laughs> Uh, and the war How was dumb can you get now? <laughs> the war was going on and you did your patriotic thing and stepped up to the plate that's and right. uh, that's that's good and uh, you wound up in the uh, in the 10th mountain division what was it like uh, when you first went into the military well of course that was in San Antonio Texas February 42, and it was cold and miserable, living in tents, freezing to death, even in San Antonio. And uh, But I survived and kept surviving. Well, San Antonio isn't in the mountains, obviously. How did nope. you wind up at Camp Hale? Well, that's after I washed out of the Air Corps, I, was, I had an honorable discharge from the Air Corps. The... the, the um, Cadet Corps was a separate entity, and it was, took an act of Congress to change it. <coughs> so anyway, I was honorably discharged, went home, stayed a month, and then, as I said, I re-enlisted mm -hmm. in the 87th. Mm -hmm. In the 87th. Do you remember any of your uh, instructors in training, any of them that stood out that you remember that were either good, bad, or indifferent? Well, we had all kinds of good, bad, and indifferent. <laughs> and uh, some had to look over their shoulders when we were in a combat zone, of course. And, but um, all, overall, if you treated them like human beings, they'd treat you like a human being. Mm -hmm. No real problems. Mm -hmm. Many were from Europe, of course, is what we, he's yeah. really The ski instructor about. type instructor oh, types yeah. were... Yeah were from Europe and mm -hmm. uh, of course they after the war they came and started the ski industry here right. 62 right. areas were started by 10th Mountain Division mm -hmm. troops mm -hmm. well let me just put up a little bit here of uh, some artwork uh, uh, Irene could you tell me about Mr. Earl who did this artwork yes he uh, was a student at Yale when he was drafted I presume he's drafted mm -hmm. and um, in fine arts and he did these during the campaigns in Kiska and Italy and at Camp Hale. He did sketches so, and so forth. And uh, then when he got back, he finished school at Yale and he taught for years in fine arts at Yale. These are beautiful works of art. John, they this are. one here is uh, climbing the pass to bivouac. Uh, can you describe some of the training you did on the bivouac with the, taking the equipment out there? And uh... well, we hauled all we, you know, all we could carry on our own backs, our own food, our own sleeping bags, and, and uh, so forth. And the rest of our equipment, as a rule, came up by mule. We had at one point two thousand mules in the tenth division. Mm -hmm. A lot of them at Camp Hale, but. Uh, and usually when we bivouacked anywhere up in the mountains, we always got the north side, which had most snow and was coldest. Mm -hmm. I think the officers had the uh, south side. <laughs> Isn't that the way it always is? <laughs> Rank has its privileges. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, we just had to live and without fires sometimes for weeks or two, week or two at a time. No fires. And it could get down to 20, 30 below zero. And uh, we get out and maneuver through the through the mountains. Set up, uh, let's call them firing lines. The artillery was right behind us, and they'd set up behind us, of course. <clears throat> and um, it, we'd kind of play war. And you were with mortars then at that time. I was with the mortar section then. I was just a, a gunner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that uh, living in uh, Waterbury prepared you for? Uh, this type of an environment, or you were just... Yeah, I think so, because I started skiing in, in, uh, seriously about 1938, and a lot of places we went, it was just plain walk. There were no lifts. Mm -hmm. 
back in New England. And uh, I skied out most all New England. Did a lot of walking up. Sometimes we get two runs a day off a mountain, and we were lucky. And I think that prepared me. And then, of course, I, I loved the Boy Scouts, and I loved the Boy Scout camp. I didn't care to be an Eagle Scout or anything beyond that, or even up to it. I just enjoyed the camping mm -hmm. and the hiking and the canoeing and the swimming. And, you, know, you, you were prepared. Irene, where did you learn to ski? Um, mostly at Winter Park. And in those days, we just had a tea bar, wasn't it? Let's see. The tea bar. The tea bar, right. Too. And uh, I went to East High School in Denver and had a lot of friends from South Denver. And many, many of these friends, the men anyway, of course there were other girls, uh, ended up, some of them, it, John was their sergeant. I see. <laughs> and uh, so I, I've always been able to be friends with the 10th Division because. I knew them all through school. Mm -hmm. is... Here's another uh, photograph of a heavy equipment infantry squad uh, climbing into position. And uh, you had to probably break those weapons down, didn't you? Base mm -hmm. plates and yeah, tubes. Yeah, base plate and the tube and the, and the bipod for the mortar. It was, came in three parts, really. But um, at one point, one of our guys his dad had a machine company back in Springfield, and uh, one of the guys in the company invented a mortar sight. So we didn't have to have the bipod. All you needed was the barrel and the base plate. And you could aim it and, and tip it for whatever uh, uh, elevation and, and distance you wanted, as long as you could see your target. Mm -hmm. And they used those in Italy. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of innovations in World War II, mm -hmm. the bomb site and medical advances. War is, war is hell, but uh, there are a lot of advances made because of survival, so that's part of, part of it. Well, how long did you uh, stay at Camp Hale before you deployed? Well, we were at Camp Hale, uh, I got there first time about uh, October of 1942. And we left there in, let's say, April sometime for um, California and did training, uh, jumping off boats onto the land and uh, so forth before we went to Kiska. And so we were there <coughs> for the winter of, let's say, 42 and 43. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and when we came back from Kiska, we were at Camp Hale from the winter of 43 into 44. Mm -hmm. Let's we talk about Kiska a little okay. bit. Uh, there's some, uh, again, Earl's paintings of uh, laying off Quisling Code as a first landing craft race for shore through fog and uncertainty. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the 10th were up there in Kiska in the uh, uh, PBS movie, The Last Ridge, which we're showing here in Aspen as a fundraiser for this project on the 27th of November. It shows Kiska, and uh, doesn't look like Southern California to me. As far as the uh, weather up there, what was the weather like, John? Cold, wet, pretty miserable, but you know you get used to it. Now the Aleutian chain reaches from, let's say, Kodiak Island, all the way to Attu, which is the length of about, <clears throat> let's say, 2,500 miles. Mm -hmm. which is part of Alaska. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bering Sea is to the north, and the North Pacific, of course, is on the south of the islands. So they always have inclement weather year-round. And the wind can blow 100, 110, 20 miles an hour. At times you had to get down on your hands and knees to go from X to Y. If you didn't, you got blown over. <laughs> Here's another, uh, after setting in the pyramidal tents and clothesline optimism with the volcano looming like the greatest of tents, there's a, uh, on the island chain of volcanoes through the Pacific, there's one of the volcanoes. Did you uh, make contact with uh, any Japanese forces? Not at all. Thank goodness. 
If we had, I wouldn't be sitting here today, I don't mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. I understand that in the middle of the night, before you got there, the Japanese left Kiska. They left about uh, a week or so, a week or up to two, two weeks before we got there, unbeknown to us, or even the uh, United States intelligence didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we weren't ready to take them on. Mm -hmm. How long were you there, Kiska? We were there from uh, August 15th until we left um, just before Thanksgiving, 1943. Mm -hmm. Ralph Ball was with you up there? Ralph was on the, on the island with us, yes. Are there any others uh, that live in the valley that were up there that you know of at Kiska? Um, Steve Knowlton was there, the guy that owned the Red Onion. Uh, Johnny, Lich, or he owned the... Um, Golden excuse, Horn. The Golden Horn. Yeah. And Litchfield was in the tenth, but Litch, I don't think, went to Kiska with us. Mm -hmm. I think he was on some other assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bert Bidwell, everybody in Aspen knows anybody knows of Bert Bidwell. He's the guy that uh, donated the. That's what I read statue. from that plaque That's at the right. Star here this morning. Bert and uh, well, it was um, oh Lord, Bill. Um, Bill Mason. Bill Mason. Bill Mason. That's uh, another name. Mason and Morse. And um, then there was uh, Bill, um, okay, the guy that owned the Aspen Times for years. Right? Dunaway. 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 Bill Dunaway. Yeah, sure. You know, at my age, I, I, I can forget things easy. Well, that's a really good recall. So anyway, uh, were you single when you went up to the Kiska? Yes, I was. Okay. Then you came back to Camp Hale, Camp Hale and... Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, date or time frame did you meet Irene? What was that? Well, I'd met her in the uh, spring, let's call it, of, of uh, 1943. And uh, we corresponded, of course, and fell in love, like all guys do, or should. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> then we were married in uh, March 18, 1944. And uh, not long after that, I headed for... Texas and Reen came with me and stayed with me till um, we were about ready to go overseas. Mm -hmm. Where were you married? We were married in Denver. In Denver. Mm -hmm. Well then, where would you live if uh, you got married? Uh, oh, I went oh, to Camp Hale. We, yeah. You went right to Camp Hale, Irene? Was, now this is, this is, I thought it was only men up there. Irene no, lived in the, in the guest house. In the guest house until <laughs> in Camp uh, Hale. Uh, John's first sergeant called me in and he, we were real good friends, and yeah. he said, he and his wife, um, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to leave because we need that space. And uh, he said, but Maude and I have a little house in Leadville we rent, and we'd love to have you share it with us. Oh. And till a few years ago, we would see them quite often. Yeah. He well, married a girl from Vancouver. Uh, BC. BC. And she's back up there now because John is gone. I see. So, and we miss them. Yeah. Um, and then I followed, I um, took the train down to. Camp follower. Yeah, camp follower. Camp follower, yes. <laughs> Jean Lindemann, who, uh, Jean Nunemacher Lindemann, uh, she lost her husband in he, the last part of the war in Italy. In Italy. And we were both pregnant by then. <laughs> in those days, you know, this happened. And so, when was your first one born? Were you overseas, John? Yes. Mm -hmm. January hot, 44. Did, 40, you 45, did you get word? Did you get word through the Red Cross? Or uh, I don't know how it came, but it came to the, the company clerk, and um, <laughs> I was sure it was going to be a boy. Yeah. So I started making bets, and everybody knew it was a girl. So I lost all the bets. You lost <laughs> all the bets. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, How many children did you have uh, through your marriage? Uh, we had Judy, our first, who was born when he was overseas. Then we had three boys. Mm -hmm. And three his boys. first sergeant and his wife, and she had a baby too, about the same time Judy was born, and she had a girl. And then she had three more girls. So this oh, was always so a kinda, joke between us because between the two his is, first sergeant really wanted a boy. Well, because you were dependent, uh, was Judy born in a military hospital? Um, no. 
Because he wasn't an officer. The oh, only, really? The officers could only go to uh, Fitzsimmons. Well, it's different in today's military. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, it different. is. So, no, it, but they paid for uh, they paid. my stay in a... Well, what, what uh, place was uh, Judy born? In Denver. In Denver. You yes. came back from Swift? Or? Yes, I came back about October, mm -hmm. and he didn't leave till November. Well, John, what's uh, a mountain division doing going to the flatland of Texas at Camp Swift? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we all wondered that ourselves. But... Uh, I don't think the United States Army knew what to do with us. They, but then all of a sudden somebody realized that the German Army was in the Alps, they were in the mountains of Italy, all through the Apennines, and uh, they needed somebody that could look at the mountain that, that didn't scare them to death. But also, we had to learn flatland infantry training, it was, it was part of the Army program, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, today's 10th Mountain Division is the Light Infantry, and they're out of Fort Drum, New York. Yeah. I just talked to them last week, and they're yes. in Afghanistan right now. I know. We've been up there. And they, they have some mules up there, too, mm -hmm. uh, go on those mm -hmm. mountains. Mm -hmm. And you had a lot, of, a lot of mules there. Well, from Camp Swift, uh, where did you go, John? Where were you transferred to? Camp Swift, we went to... Uh, uh, Camp Patrick Henry down at, I think it was Hampton Roads, Virginia, <clears throat> and that's where we embarked for Italy. Mm -hmm. Arrived in Naples, got off the boat, got onto a freight car, and went north mm -hmm. to Florence. And, and the front line was just north of Florence at the time. Mm -hmm. Tuscany. Tuscany. Any county? Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, I'm oh, going yeah. there, going there soon. Molto mm -hmm. County. Well, yeah, yeah. Wilto Banny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's that's good. Um, I'm going to put up a picture here of uh, Riva Ridge, Italy. Shells bursting around the tower uh, in Rocca Cornetta. And if you could just mention a little bit about when you were committed to combat. Uh, Reaver Ridge is over on the right if you go to the Apennines and then a Belvedere over on the left. Where, no, where were you? No, as you go north, Belvedere is on the right and oh, the other Reaver's way around. on the left. Reaver's on the left. <laughs> In okay. fact, these are the lower slopes of, of uh, Belvedere right here. Mm -hmm. And we were up, Belvedere is here, across the valley is Reaver Ridge. We could see it. <clears throat> Had no idea what was going on over there, of mm -hmm. course. So you went up Belvedere? Yes. You went up Belvedere. And what was the purpose of taking Reaver Ridge in the first place? Well, uh, the Germans were well established on Reaver Ridge, and they could look. It was higher than Belvedere. And they could look over Belvedere. They could look over the whole valley to the south. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, observers up there for mm -hmm. the artillery. Because uh, I remember once, I guess it was on Belvedere, my runner, a guy named McDonald, he and his brother, they were both uh, outdoor people, and they loved to have tans. Oh. So one day it was nice and warm in February, and they took off their shirts and were out laying, getting a tan. Next thing I know, we were bombarded. Oh the guys, I'm sure, on Riva or somewhere up there could see us. And, you know, a white body shows up even though there was snow up there. Sure. It wasn't. 100% snow, especially if you laid out a big GI blanket and you were laying in the middle of it. So anyway, that's one part. So uh, there was a night assault up the 2,000-foot cliffs to take out that uh, observation post before that's right. we could go on to Belvedere. Before we went to Belvedere. Mm -hmm. So you lined up and, and, uh, and got in uh, formation and moved up Belvedere. And I understand oh. there were minefields mm -hmm. and... Uh, a lot of uh, it was mined, and booby traps of all kinds, and they they set up a like a, a hand grenade tied to a tree with a string across, or maybe down where your feet had hit it, mm -hmm. and uh, that happened. And then just flares that guys would step on, or or a machine might, you know. We had some tanks up there, nothing big, mm -hmm. small tanks. And they, some of those guys got blown up on the road, mm -hmm. so they had to take care of that. Mm -hmm. So here you are, Irene, back in Denver. Yes. With a, a baby. 
Mm -hmm. John's over in Italy with right, the 10th Mountain with Division. with my parents. You were with your parents, mm -hmm. and uh, were you writing letters back and forth? Yes, uh, some, as much as, well, I, I think I could more often than John, because he didn't have any place to send them out. We didn't have the communications they have today. <laughs> no no say, email. No cell phones. No, no and every, uh, no supposedly everything was censored, and John's letters were, because he He's that nature. He wasn't about to. You mean a, give a black line draw through certain mm -hmm. words? Mm -hmm. You couldn't say where you were, or places or where you were going. So they were. Or where you'd I didn't have really any information where he was, mm -hmm. except he was in Italy. Were you following uh, the war in the newspapers and the Denver papers? Yes. And guessing or? Wondering? It was very vague. Very vague. They, they didn't put much in in those days. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. I think I told you earlier, I found out he was injured uh, from his father. They sent the telegram to his father in Waterbury <laughs> instead of to me, and I didn't know how serious it was. So Well, probably... Was, my dog tags were still Waterbury. Yeah, and yeah. your next of kin was your father before, mm -hmm. you see, in the military, yeah. Yeah. things happen, and Irene didn't get put down as a next of kin. Mm -hmm. Evidently. So yes. at some point going up Belvedere, John, you got hit... No, I got nope. hit later on. That later was, on? Yeah. After Belvedere? Yeah, another push. Was that the push to the pole? No, I didn't make it that far. We were at, um, up on a, I got hit on a place called Mount Della, Della Vedetta. It's, uh, oh, probably 20 miles south of Bologna, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. In the Apennines. In the Apennines. From some points, we could almost see the valley. But uh, I got nailed and uh, went back to the aid station, of course, and then from there to the field hospital, and uh, from the field hospital to Livorno, to the general hospital. <clears throat> and there um, I recuperated and got back on my feet, and they sent me back up to the company. So that was a Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, were you awarded the Bronze Star in conjunction yes, with that yes. action? I, I think lots of Bronze Stars were handed out, as you, mm -hmm. you probably well, know. They were well earned, and yeah. Um, so, uh, you, did you uh, uh, get transferred back to the states, or no. in the rear they they moved forward? I went the... back up to the company and stayed till the end of the war up uh -huh. there. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of the uh, bombardment. There is. Uh, heroically built Bailey Bridge. That was a temporary bridge that the Army engineers mm -hmm. built. And Punchboard Hill bombarded with two German shells a minute. Can you take a look at that one? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, we lived, I was living right about up in here on Punchboard Knob. And uh, this this is the bridge at Malandroni that they finally finished. But um, the, in the early morning, I'd hear trucks coming up the highway our trucks, bringing engineers to build a bridge, the bridge. They'd get about here, and this phosphorus shell would hit the ground, and the next thing you know, the Germans had them cornered. Mm -hmm. So it took them a long time to get a bridge built. Uh, but once they did, then they could bring stuff across, and we were heading up north mm -hmm. to where I got nailed up there on that push. We lost a lot of men that day. We lost uh, Torgatogo was killed for one, and a lot of people know of Torgatogo. Mm -hmm. He was the greatest jumper. ski jumper in the world. Torgatogo, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's in uh, he's in this movie here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I skied with Torger up at Steamboat Springs. Oh. He wasn't worth a hoop downhill, but he a hell of a jumper. <laughs> really, really good in the yeah. air. Nice guy. Well, these names keep coming up of uh, people that went on to, uh, before the war, were famous for their skiing, coming from mm -hmm. Europe and building up the 10th Mountain, and then after the war going into the ski uh, ski areas and uh, carrying on these, these traditions uh, after the war. Uh, what was the food like there, John? Did you? Uh, on the front lines, mostly K rations mm -hmm. and C rations. But uh, once when we were up uh, on another part of the front, they decided that we should have hot meals cooked mm -hmm. by the cooks back back of the front line somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
So one day I went down, I volunteered to go down and bring food up. And I had this pack on my back, a pack board with this great big kettle of soup or something. Got about almost back up to the company and they started to nail us with artillery. So I hit the ground, of course, and unbeknown to me, the, a guy reached out of a foxhole in a gully and dragged me in and saved my life, probably. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we got through that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those foxholes were something they were dug by the Brazilians. Brazilians. Brazil had one, um, uh, I don't know, battalion, I guess, at least, in Italy. And uh, in fact, it was up on, was it Punchboard Knob? Or where was it? To where we first went. I think it was there that we relieved the Brazilians. Mm -hmm. And we got there about midnight, darker than the inside of a cow. And uh, this Brazilian guy was trying to tell me where the front was, where his targets were in Portuguese. And of course, I spoke a lot of Portuguese, <laughs> oh. which I didn't. You didn't, but. <laughs> Even but, when uh, we went anyway, to Brazil, it was tough. So yeah. I said, OK, and I was just yes, back and forth, OK, OK, OK. And they left, and they hurried. They went out of there flying, and I don't blame them because, as they say, they they were nailing us every hour on the hour. It seemed like. But uh, anyway, that was my one of my first baptisms. Well, after these uh, firefights, uh, did you ever get back for re uh, rest and recuperation in the rear and and uh, get some rest and clean up, or was it just I I push? didn't until the first uh, R and R was after I got hit, I think, and the guys mm -hmm. went back to uh, I think it was Monte mm -hmm. It's uh, east of Florence, near Pisa, in that area. It's a it's a spa, mm -hmm. and uh, full of vino and women, exciting, I guess. Mm -hmm. So. Irene's back here uh, with the baby and with the family. Uh, the Christmas of 1944, what was that like? Where were you? Christmas of 44, I, we were heading for, uh, we were on a boat heading for Italy. How did you, you remember celebrating that on the boat? I don't think we even knew it was Christmas. Mm -hmm. I mean, time doesn't mean anything to us. I, I, in fact, when going to Kiska, we were tied up in San Francisco Harbor before we left. On the 28th of July, that's my birthday. Your birthday. On the 29th, I realized yesterday was my birthday. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> all I wanted to do was get into San Francisco, but they wouldn't let us off the boat. Yeah. And uh, Irene, how, how did you, the Christmas of 44, how did you celebrate well, that? You just... family and their friends. I don't know the feeling. I can't remember except. You just had to keep telling yourself, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. You'll come back. Praying, yeah. And then some of my friends would lose their husbands and Air Corps and so on. Hey, it was tough. Do you remember what it was like, the country behind the war? We were attacked in our survival. Was it? Uh... I felt people were really behind it. They realized. They were mad. They, we've got to do something. I, I think they were. I didn't remember people complaining that we were at war. Mm -hmm. I, How about, uh, could you get tires for your cars and a lot of gasoline and <laughs> sugar? Well, I didn't drive. My father didn't believe when, in women drivers till I finally learned. And then Times he thought it changed. was great to pick up mother, you see, as mm -hmm. I got older. Mm -hmm. uh, no, during the war I didn't drive. And uh, my father was able to get gasoline. And, mm -hmm. We could get some meat. It was hard up at CU. We hardly ever had meat. It was because mm -hmm. they took our ration oh, points took your at the college. And then, points. of course, a lot of the men were pulling off. It was difficult going to college mm -hmm. in those days. And I think by the time I left, it, uh, most of the men were just uh, with the Japanese language school mm -hmm. uh, getting ready to had that direction, I guess. I remember I was about eight years old, and my mother saved the bacon grease for explosives. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a victory garden. And uh, mm -hmm. here again, the way I told it, we told, could keep track of the days of the week. Every We raised rabbits in the backyard. And uh, 
every Sunday we had rabbits, so I mean, it could count on <laughs> rabbit on Sundays. <laughs> we didn't have toys. Uh, my dad made toy guns and little wagons out of scrap wood, mm -hmm. but and we had a radio. We got along fine. I mean, I, I felt that the country really pulled together. I was on the West Coast. and uh, I think it's good they did. Because mm -hmm. it could have been disastrous, mm -hmm. probably. Well, John, you came out of the Depression. Mm -hmm. Both of you came mm -hmm. out of the Depression. Mm -hmm. And so you knew tough times before the war. Yeah, it I didn't lived in strike a, either one of us. It didn't, it didn't really hit me too because bad, Because I personally. think we were lucky, middle class. But um, the city I grew up in is a manufacturing city, brass mills. And, uh, pretty if you much mostly just watch the and, war uh, picture, the war things they're putting but, on but, uh, public radio, but I you know that they've been right. doing. The seven hour. They, mm -hmm. One of the cities was Waterbury, Connecticut, that they chose. Mm -hmm. But in 1938, mm. uh, in Waterbury, I worked for a company, part of Anaconda Copper Company, and uh, we were getting big orders from the arsenal out in Denver for brass goods and shipbuilders in Maine and all over the country for brass, for ships. Mm -hmm. And in 1938, America was starting to put a machine together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Ken Burns, who did the uh, movie that you mm -hmm. watched, uh, mentioned this project we're working on for people to support the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, which we're doing mm -hmm. now, and we're moving forward to uh, interview 20 more next year. We've done 20, you're 22 now, two of you. And um, we're doing a big uh, uh, showing of this movie, The Last Ridge of the 10th Mountain Division, on the 27th of November at the Wheeler Opera House. So there's a lot of awareness out there for what's going on. Um, how about Easter 1945? Where were you? Do you remember that? Easter? Mm-hmm. I might have been in the hospital. In the hospital, maybe. In uh, Livorno. In Livorno. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where were you when the war over there on the 2nd of May, when, when it ended? And what was your reaction? We were <coughs> very happy, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody cheering and hollering. and. Let's see, just before that, though, not long before that, Roosevelt died. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was kind of a sad day for, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for many of us. Um, not the Republicans, I'm sure, but um, for some of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Irene, what was uh, the 2nd of May like for you in Denver in the war, when the European oh, War ended? I was very happy, except the only other thing. I do remember that they said probably Japan would be next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, Did you uh, take uh, Judy, the baby, out into the streets of Denver or out in the oh, streets? Oh, of course. You know, I mean, was it mm -hmm. gathering? Uh, and well, some. We were in, you know, a neighborhood far from downtown, so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, everybody was quite happy. And, of course, John would be coming home. Yes, I thought, except that then he was teaching rock climbing up in Yugoslavia. <laughs> he was sent up there. Tell us about that, John. <laughs> after, this was after the war was over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we the European in, War, yeah. yeah. We were in a, a little town, I think it was Staricello, just near Caporetto. And Caporetto is one of the most famous places in Italy from World War I. Mm -hmm. And uh, just north of, north of Caporetto, we had a climbing school. And uh, one of my friends in the outfit, an officer, asked me if I wanted to teach rock climbing. I'd never taught rock climbing. So I said, sure. <laughs> 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 so we went up in northern Italy. It was right on the corner of where Yugoslavia, Italy, and Austria come together. A town called Tarvisio was our closest town. We had a neat spot, had a little pond there. We had a boat, rowboat on it. And at one point at the rocks, rock climbing school, we saw this, uh, it was up, it, way up in the hills, in the mountains. This road went by us through our camp, little camp. We only had two or three tents. And 
up comes this vehicle. It was an army vehicle, and it went past us. Pretty soon that vehicle came down, and behind it there's this farmer screaming and hollering and waving his arms. So we all got, grabbed our rifles, we always carried a rifle, got out and stopped the vehicle, see what was going on. Well, it was a bunch of Jewish soldiers, officers mostly. They'd gone up there and they had stolen one of his calves oh. and had it in the back of their vehicle. Mm -hmm. It was like a covered jeep, big thing. Mm -hmm. So we stopped them and made them pull, the calf was still alive, made them pull the calf out and give it back to the farmer and told him to get out of there. We could have started an international <laughs> incident, I'm sure. <laughs> and none of us could speak Jewish or, or Hebrew right. or anything. Right. But we conveyed to them we weren't fooling. We all had rifles. <laughs> well, the other uh, that was fun. Uh, units of the division moved north toward the Po Valley, and uh, here's Lake Garda mm -hmm. here. And uh, it shows, you know, the German emplacements there. Tunnels in the mountains. Well, most of the tunnels, I think, were on the left bank. On the left yeah. bank. On the left other bank. side. Mm -hmm. this, we this were there after Riva the war. Yeah. Is on the right bank, and the town of mm -hmm. Desenzano was down here, and the town of. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of it. There's a, it goes almost into Austria. Mm -hmm. The lake does. Beautiful and, lake. And that shows uh, mm -hmm. in. Uh, the last yeah. ridge, there's mm -hmm. some beautiful mm -hmm. villas yes. there on the shores. Oh, yeah. Now it's and, beautiful. Uh, Mussolini had mm -hmm. one. Mussolini mm -hmm. had one, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, uh, you know, leave it to the uh, the troops to entertain themselves and the, the shooting's over with. Uh, Ralph Ball tells me they captured a couple of German light uh, patrol boats and uh, being skiers in that, they rigged <laughs> up some uh, water skiing for themselves on Lake Garda there. And then they also did a lot of recreational climbing, and mm -hmm. you were mm -hmm. you were doing teaching uh, mm -hmm. of the climbing there. At the point uh, when the war ended, then uh, at that point, from what I read, is that the 10th Mountain Division was uh, going to uh, redeploy to Japan, and yes. uh, the war was still going on in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And do you recall getting on the ship, John, and headed back to the Panama Canal for Japan? And no. I think we knew we were going back. You to, knew we were going back to the states. Yeah, I, uh, Ralph Ball told me that they were headed to the Panama Canal on his ship, and oh, it might have been. But and they I went know. to back to back he to the states. He got back much sooner. You than never John. know where, when you're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. what the captain of the ship is that's going right. to do or knows. You that's know? right. He's he's the number one guy. I don't know. Gus, Gus must have been guessing on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's some great uh, great stories. Um, we have some photographs that we're going to uh, review after we, we finish talking here. Uh, after the, you landed in the States, where, which way direction did you head? I headed north. I went back to Fort Devens, Mass, where I had enlisted. Instead of them sending me to Carson and discharging me there, this is the way the Army works, as you know. He tried. He came back. To so Denver, I went back to uh, <laughs> and then Fort Devens, Mass. And had to go back again to be discharged. No, instead of did I? Yes. I guess I got. Yeah, yes, I guess we, I was, so yeah. you got discharged in October 1945. Uh, the Japanese yeah, peace treaty didn't sign, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you picked up uh, Baby Judy and Irene, and headed back to. Waterbury, Connecticut. No, we didn't. No. no. We stayed in Denver. She wouldn't, stayed she in Denver. wouldn't go back east. And I, would... I had been there while he was, I had <laughs> oh, phoned back with Judy to show her grandparents. Okay. So, so we, we decided we to stay out west. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We debated this. We stayed this. with Reen's folks for a while and then built our own house. And... In Denver. In, in Denver. Denver. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, use the GI Bill for no, I didn't. schooling or house or anything? So what what did you do then, John? You I got... worked for Reen's dad had a, a business, air conditioning and heating, and I worked for him for some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I worked for another company in the same business, and then <coughs> until uh, about 1950, then another guy and I bought a our own business. Mm -hmm. 
And um, at what point did you uh, head to the mountains and make a decision you wanted to live up here with us? Well, we we with you. Every weekend we were off in the summertime, especially camping and with our kids and f fishing and in the wintertime skiing, even when they were little kids. And I had one son, he was the greatest snowplower in the world. At about five years old or six, he could snowplow from the top of Aspen Mountain to the bottom. <laughs> was that Larry? <laughs> Larry. Larry's a friend of mine. Snowplow yes. Joe, he used to go yeah. snowplow Joe. <laughs> How he did it, I don't know. It yeah. killed me. Yeah. And so um, this traveling around the world, uh, and you've sold your business in Denver and moved up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, did you do any traveling after Italy, uh, the two of you? Oh, uh, yeah. In 1962, we took all four kids to Italy ages 10 to 18. That was the first national reunion. First national reunion. Really Italy. Wonderful and, uh, trip. After the reunion, we rented a car in Milano and um, went up through Switzerland, Austria, Germany, to the Hook of Holland, took a boat back to England and came home. That was our first big trip. And that was wonderful trip. to do that because our daughter was 17 at the time, oh, ready yeah. to go to college. and. We yeah. all were together, and all together. we all treasure that memory. What about other trips? We've oh. taken we, any, we've any other continents. To, yeah, we've been all seven. <laughs> all seven. <laughs> all seven continents, yeah. including Antarctica. Antarctica, including Antarctica. and yeah. Australia, oh, Antarctica, Africa, oh, yeah, Asia. Not all of Asia, but parts. Yeah. Parts. Enough to say we've been there. Mm -hmm. Well, what's and next? Europe, lots. We don't know. We've Silk, been, maybe. We've been Silk. doing. Uh, <laughs> we've been doing uh, trips to. We've been all over South America. Had never been to Central America, but we have a grandson who's uh, an engineer in a gold mine in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And we just had our ninth great grandchild born in Guatemala City. Ninth great grandchild. Beautiful little boy. Mm -hmm. Sixty-three years of marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. to the same girl. The same girl. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so many of our friends have been married half a dozen times. Yeah. And and some of them didn't, you know, when we got married, we were sort of one of the first to do this during the war, knowing right. they were going to have to go overseas. We did a lot of first, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, what's uh, that? Well, you're in Central America. I don't know. We'll uh, probably go down there I'd, again. I'd like to go back to France or Italy. Yes, I would. Italy, I'd well, like we're, to go. Well, my wife and I are going countries. to Tuscany, uh, oh, yeah, I know. Florence. Uh, Lucky. So, yeah. I go along as your interpreter. You want to go? All right. And drink with Chianti? Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Right. Bene, <laughs> grazie. Um, what um, influence do you think the military had about uh, your civilian life? Do you think that... Uh, it uh, made you a little more observant of what our country's all about and who the people are, or? That's right, and uh, as I told you, Dick, that um, one of the greatest things to me that came out of the, uh, the military was the guys I served with mm -hmm. and then the people I have met since, like yourself. If it hadn't been for World War II, I feel I'd probably be married to some old broad in Vermont, on a, on some old farm up there, and starving to death. But because of the way life was. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, it it makes you appreciate our country and the world, and makes you want to go out and. It, and, it, and yes. it taught me to a lot more tolerance. Now I had a lot of tolerance when I was a kid because in my hometown. There were 25,000 Italians, either first or second generations, mm -hmm. Polish people, Lithuanians, Russians, French, and um, so, it, but the army, you became tolerant of people from Texas or Boston or any other part of the country with little different cultures. And, uh, but I think it's the people I have met mm -hmm. since the war that have influenced me as much as anything. Uh, in running your company, uh, the people that work for you, uh, do you think it made you more understanding of their personal problems? Very and, much. And 
that what you give is what you get back. In other words, if you're a good boss mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. you know uh, the uh, thing in the military, uh, you tro your troops right and your fellow soldiers right, then everything's going to be okay. That's right. And, and you know, that's because I hired uh, African Americans, as we call them today, and I hired uh, Latinos and whites. And uh, after were, work, a lot of times I'd go out and have a beer with the, the black guys. And they, we'd have a great time. They appreciated time. it, and they were very yeah, nice were. to me. If John had to go off or go and off with his many of his for a few days, I'd take care of the uh, office. Mm -hmm. Because of business. the type of business, mm -hmm. many of my employees were ex-convicts. I had mm -hmm. lifers, mm -hmm. finally got out. Mm -hmm. and we all got along because mm -hmm. I understood them, I guess. Right, and I know that uh, having been in combat myself in Vietnam, some of the the best men that were in combat uh, were had police records, had drinking problems, but when the chips were down, they were there for you. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and, uh, we had mm -hmm. the same way. Same and thing. you have to, you know, treat them as human beings, and and, the, right. and it comes right back, you know, to you. Speaking of that, Dick, we had one guy who was born here in Aspen or Woody Creek, George Tukuchik. George is dead now, but he was in my company. Oh. And George was a pretty yeah. good drinker. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> He's buried out at As uh, Red Butte Cemetery. Yes. I've been to his grave site. And, uh, yep. George. George, yeah, and uh, Bidwell, he's up in Aspen Grove. Because mm -hmm. we went to his yep. so, service. Yeah, he's up there. Yeah, George was a great guy, but and, but when the chips were down, he was Well, he was part soldier. of an Aspen family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Gerbaz. Uh, the Maraults. Maraults. Maraults, yeah. yeah. I think mm -hmm. his mother was a Marault. Yeah, right. his mother right. was well, a Marault. Mm -hmm. We decorate, we put an American flag on his grave on uh, mm -hmm. Memorial mm -hmm. Day. Over here at the Red Butte Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And George, George is one of Petusha. these guys, when the fight started, you want George on your side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. American <laughs> fighting man. Oh, God, he was something. Well, we're about ready to conclude yes. here um, on this interview. Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered today? No. I can't think of anything really, one bit of levity, I guess, to bring into it. We have to have that. <coughs> when my helps. I wrote my father and told him I was going to get married. And he wrote back and he said, Dear John, any damn fool who takes on two battles at once, I have no sympathy for him whatsoever. <laughs> uh -oh. Typical New England <laughs> My father was not one who believed in, in the sacred marriage, I guess. <laughs> but he, he raised me pretty good kid, I well, guess. Well, and he was a little worried about me because he thought she we was had, Indian. He, he, you West. know, he, he'd never been West. And I'm never sure he West. thought. But yeah. fortunately, I was blonde, blue-eyed, and I didn't smoke because he didn't like women who had smoked. good teeth. <laughs> and I had good teeth. teeth. I, yeah. a girl I still good have teeth. them, and I yeah. didn't never smoke, thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we so. want to thank you for uh, your years of service. Uh, serving our country, uh, John, and uh, we want to thank you uh, a lot, Irene, for keeping the home fires burning and telling us about what it was like uh, to be a military wife and uh, and uh, pray and, and pull for the troops. And it all happened, and it turned out to be uh, we were winners. And we hope that these interviews will uh, inspire the younger people to appreciate and understand what you went through to keep our country free. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I can get up. <laughs> oh, yeah, up okay. yeah. And what we'll do here is uh, film some of these black and whites uh, I have right here. Has he turned off the mics? Yeah, okay. we're, we're, we're off now. We're oh, off. Okay. Thank you.